before we start off, I thought it might be a good idea to just give a quick introduction to all the panelists so we know who we have over here. Uh, let's start with Chaitali. Chaitali is uh, she's a partner with PwC India and she's part of the PwC Management Consulting Division. Uh, prior to PwC, Chaitali was part of Confrey Hay Group's leadership team in India. And uh, Chaitali, uh, we're hoping you'll be able to uh, bring an entirely different perspective to the topic today. So glad to have you here. Uh, thank you for making it. Thank you. Uh, Anil Joshi is managing partner at Unicorn India Ventures. Anil has a rich experience both on the investment uh, playground as well as with the corporate sector. He was earlier president of Mumbai Angel. So in case there are uh, startup uh, entrepreneurs here and you have questions for Anil, feel free to pose them to him, and I'm sure he'll be happy to answer those uh, post this session. Um, Anil has a rich experience both in the corporate space as well as uh, an angel investor and a VC investor. So glad to have you here to Anil. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Uh, Venkatesh is uh, uh, somebody I'm hoping will bring a lot of deep uh, expertise to the topic. Uh, Venkatesh is part of NSDC, that's the National Skills Development Corporation, uh, which is uh, partly uh, uh, has stake from the government of India. Uh, Venkatesh uh, has earlier been country director with with, uh, with uh, uh, Deloitte India, and he spent a long time, uh, Venkatesh, about 10 years with Microsoft? Yeah, 10 years with Microsoft. And uh, at Microsoft, he was leading their academic initiatives and also the Microsoft Innovation Center, I recall. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of expectation from you, Venkatesh, and I uh, hope that you're able to fill in some of the gaps there in case we have any. Uh, glad that you could make it. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Ekman. Really appreciate it. Dr. Raman, um, uh, I know we've interacted on a couple of forums earlier, and therefore it was... Uh, very delightful for me that you could make it uh, for this particular forum as well. Dr. Raman, for those who uh, don't know, is Director at SIBM Pune. He's also Dean Faculty of Management uh, for Symbiosis International University. He's worked earlier with SPJN Institute of Management and Research as well. Was it in Bombay, uh, uh, Dr. Raman? Yeah. Uh, he, <clears throat> Dr. Raman is one of the prominent educationists and, and, and thought leaders in the region. So we have a fairly eminent panel here. I'm very excited to be moderating this. Uh, uh, for the participants, we have locked you. The only reason is that uh, at times, willy-nilly, uh, uh, you know, there are audio disturbances otherwise. Uh, if you do have questions, feel free to put them up on the public chat. I might not take those questions uh, while the discussion is going on, uh, but I'll certainly pick them up as soon as the discussion is over. So the way this uh, <clears throat> the way this entire discussion is planned, we have about 45, uh, <clears throat> 45 minutes odd for the discussion and then 30 to 45 minutes for questions. So uh, I'm hoping that all of you will have an opportunity to ask questions to the panel. And uh, until then, tighten your seat belts, uh, grab a coffee and, uh, you know, just enjoy the discussion. So, um, Tetali, a uh, gentleman, my first two or three questions are actually going to be generic. They're going to be common to all of you. So feel free to add your perspective. Uh, Chaitali, let's start with you. Uh, there's a lot of talk about global mega trends happening that could possibly impact upskilling and reskilling. Uh, what is your perspective on that? What would be that one big global mega trend that you would pick up that you would want to talk about? Firstly, thanks uh, for having me on this session, Jagmohan. And, and it's a complete pleasure. Um, the moment we talk about global mega trends, there is a lot that keeps getting spoken about. And I'll stick to what the SPWC we have put on the table. We call it the ADAPT. Uh, it's, it's a short acronym for uh, something which has changed the world. Um, the E stands for asymmetry. And the asymmetry is an asymmetry in uh, <clears throat> you know, the moving middle class out. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a lot of other things that make asymmetry at a global or at even country levels a huge problem. Uh, of course, my D is for disruption caused by technology, A is DH, B is the populism or the nationalism sentiment, and T is the trust. So we believe that, and then we wrote about ADAPT, I think, uh, three and a half years back, or rather four years back, when we were saying that the whole world is going to see 
very uh, difficult uh, situations and everybody at that point in time was only talking about age and was talking about technology but we were talking about asymmetry in um, economic levels asymmetry in uh, opportunities and we were also talking about a rising uh, <clears throat> polarization that's going to happen as a result of nationalism and 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 uh, its impact on trust and the moment you apply a lens like adapt to something as uh, skills it completely changes the paradigm because here we were looking at technology and its advent on us and and hence what are the new skills that we need but the moment you actually apply uh, populism or nationalism you apply uh, depleting trust and you also apply asymmetry which has actually impacted the world in in unbelievable ways uh, i think uh, skills will actually have to be taught through in a very different way uh, and i would hence want to talk uh, of technology and age as being uh, factors but more so about asymmetry and uh, the whole nationalism and the impact of that on how we need to look at building skills in a very big way okay so <clears throat> i'm guessing that there will be a fair amount of commentary around some of those areas as we proceed uh, chat ali and uh, um uh feel free to add to some of these areas as we as we go forward but that's an interesting thought there uh now dr raman what's 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 your uh, top pick as far as global mega trends are concerned well uh, according to me the global mega trend from an education perspective is going to be digital transformation uh one area which was not really touched uh as far as the digital aspects is the indian education system <clears throat> we had a lot of uh, uh you know um, people talking about uh, the coursera and the edx of the world but still the enrollments and people used to complete the courses were not so many statistics say that only about 10 to 12% of them complete but from an indian perspective uh, the indian universities especially were not uh, really going uh, digital when it comes to imparting education so uh, thanks to covid times that this is changing now we are forced to go and adapt digital and uh, ensure that we are i mean some are trying some of them have already you know tried tested and are doing great in that space so the big uh, mega trend as far as education is digital transformation and many indian universities are not prepared for it that's one thing they are trying testing and uh, apart from that the uh, the policy measures in place are not very clear uh there are people who are uh, trying to bring in the policies in place for it to be accepted so that's going to be a great change and a, a trend for sure which will be hitting the indian education system okay so according to me that's what is the big global mega trend uh, which is going to hit india and the indian education system yeah so it's it's interesting that you brought up that that a uh, uh, point on you know low completion rates and i think that's been something that's plagued most of the mooks uh coursera in fact amongst the other moocs might probably have coursera along with edx might probably have a slightly higher completion rate uh but when you look at some of the other ones especially uh uh, uh where uh there is not too much of control on uh who's putting up content and the kind of content that's being put up the completion rates there are as low as 3 to 4% yeah. and i i think that that's a, that's a very cogent point uh to your point on policies and how that could possibly impact some of this uh towards the end of this discussion i am going to be asking a question around policy uh specifically for you and venkatesh uh and i'm hoping that at that point you might want to elaborate a bit more uh on that area but thank sure. you so much for around uh anil uh, what is your uh, pick for the global mega trends so uh i think <clears throat> both jenali and doctor have you know covered their respect uh, maybe for different verticals but i think uh, life is same for everyone uh, we are not able to move we are confined to you know specific area and uh, considering the way things are you know uh, going uh, and behaving i think this thing will continue to exist right so we have to learn we have to unlearn we have to reskill upskill right so everything will apply to everyone right for example i visualize you know or we visualize this in two categories right one the intellectual you know work force of people like us who could definitely work from you know given space but what about the carpenter right he can't 
he can't make a you know and deliver stool or, or furniture in our zoo right he have to act physically right he have to move up, right so so you know things uh, have changed and people have to adopt to it uh, we actually have been seeing that in some cases the productivity of people have gone up right because they any case were doing it they got you know room to play with it so their productivity went up but at the same time there are people you know whose productivity have gone down because they chose not to you know learn something when you know they could have learned so if they don't learn i think the chances of they you know getting out of business or you know not able to be relevant to the given situation is very high right so uh, i think it's a question of survival uh, it's a question on question of you know being in existence and hence you know uh, we have to adopt we have to you know uh, look at you know this new normal in different way and accordingly you know keep learning uh, or what you are saying you know reskilling or upskilling on daily basis right so tomorrow let's say yesterday i did something i was able to manage but today you know if i have to you know learn something uh, to be relevant i have to do that right uh, for example now you know wearing mask and moving out is very normal right uh, i still observe uh, i'm more talking you know from from you know general perspective uh, because you know technically both uh, you know and doctor have you know expressed and i'm sure and they also have to share but but you know uh, you know i I'm, i'm observing this my personal observation right we we wear mask but when two people are talking the mask is not right so i i think we have to learn to speak with mask you know on face because that's not only protecting you but the other guy that's the way you know new normal will be right so, i don't so, know how 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 so i think what i what i hear you saying is that uh, there is a certain amount of unpredictability which is inbuilt into the system um and um uh you know black swan events uh uh which earlier used to happen maybe once in three decades uh are now are happening once in a decade and possibly will start happening uh, once a year going forward and there needs to be a certain amount of agility and adaptability which is inherent within the the individual or the organization if you're talking you know in the context of organizations to be able to uh to quickly adapt and 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 move on uh great uh that is a fine point there uh venkatesh are you are you there i can't see you yes yes i'm there uh so before i move on to the next one would you want to add anything to the global mega trends uh anything that you see impacting uh, upscaling and reskilling i think you know the anil uh picking up what anil said uh lifelong learning has become the new trend so it's no more that uh you learn something and then you uh use that learning for a longer duration because uh, the way technology is uh, disrupting uh and it would completely rechange the ecosystem for example let's look at our own indian it ecosystem in fevi protesia sel cognis and tech mahindra the service based companies which are predominantly giving lot of employment for our engineers uh you know on ground from a software perspective uh you know if you look into the technology adoption and the digital transformation you know how things are changing uh you know uh, from a technology standpoint from a horizontal view even as a sectorial view the sectors are completely redefining for example covid is an uh, unanticipated it is not anticipated and it's an uh, a great uh, impact on the technology shifting the gears you know for example if you if you look into an infosys which has uh, more retail focus or maybe a tech mahindra which has more digital transformation focus you know and some sectors which are badly affected for example the services companies which are focusing on hospitality uh, large uh, retail outlets and large, you know supply chain uh, ecosystems telecom and automobile all the sectors are not moving in the same way we're adjusting to the new normal so the growth trends would be different so of course then there would be a shift in terms of the demand gap supplies and the organizations have to quickly adjust to those ecosystems and you know, for example i would certainly see a sector like telecom doing good for the couple of quarters maybe in the next 4 to 8 quarters telecom across the world will do good because the consumption uh, is going good uh, not only indian majors but also the majors so if i look back 6 months into the ecosystem in fact telecom was not doing good you know so you know in india 
you know the players last players have suffered and india had its own piece of challenges so when you are in an ecosystem of uh, you know supporting large organizations or sectors and you have people you know there's a immediate need not only to learn something new and adapt to it and so hence it becomes a lifelong learning ecosystem and also it's important to unlearn sort of a lot of things you know unlearning is very important so it's not just a piece of learning uh, you know at every stage at every uh, you know year as the companies grow they need to unlearn a lot of things to learn new things so that's the uh, new normal now and this will continue because the rate at which we are accelerating the changes is uh, is rapid and we we can't anticipate what works right now will it work after 2 years a lot of things will change i think um, the challenge that most people and organizations face um it is not just the attitude towards and learning and learning something new it's also knowing at times uh, what to unlearn right yeah. because uh, uh if you don't know that uh you just persist with it so but but point taken um since there's been a lot of talk around technology i i had a question and and uh any of the panelists could feel free to respond to that one you know of late there's been a lot, lot of emphasis uh on on upskilling and reskilling for the tech sector domains um, right whether it's ai whether it's data science in general iot cloud computing and and so on now um, there are people who who believe that this might uh, be a bit of a myopic view because uh, uh you know it, it's too tech centric and therefore the question is this sustainable so my question to you is is this indeed myopic uh, and do you I uh, feel that uh, this emphasis on tech areas uh, as far as upskilling and reskilling is concerned is, is that short lived uh, is that a temporary phenomena or is this here to stay i know there are a lot of uh, questions around that but i uh, feel free to pick up the one that you want to respond to i i somehow feel you know technology is an enabler in the skilling process you know so tech sector is not just uh, one sector where one should always depend because it's always important to diversify your uh you know when skilling is concerned or even the development of any nation is concerned that diversification across sectors is very very important because technology is one of the sectors for example at nsdc if i look into from an indian perspective we have 37 sector skill councils you know so we, from agriculture green jobs to automotive then uh, you know even a honey bee keeping you know is a sector you know so within the agriculture so you know there are multiple sectors and one such sector skill council is you know your it sector skill council which is nascom so having a diversified approach is always good but you know in an, in, in in it depends on time to time you know for example the it sector skill council or nascom has done phenomenal work in the last couple of years the opportunity was good uh, indian it services firms have tapped into that opportunity india has become one of the largest service provider uh, globally uh because of our because of lot of things coming to play it's not just a, a sector wants to grow uh it depends on the task force it depends on uh, the availability of the resources uh, and how the ecosystem is evolved if you look into nam from 1980s till now india services industry uh, from an it sector had grown it's not just because uh, the uh, the the growth opportunity was there it's also about the resources trainings and even the college ecosystems you can see how uh, different ecosystems have come together the emphasis on computer science as a stream have gone up you know but again sometimes we overdo that you know that's where the challenge is that's where the demand supply gap is today uh, you know as for the icit you know 60% of the qualified engineers uh, don't have the relevant jobs uh, which is not a good number and especially a country like india where we are looking at a uh, demographic advantage of being the youngest nation in terms of the population within the age groups of anywhere between 2015 to you know 35 kind of an age group we will have, have the demographic advantage so it's also important to guide uh, and also at a strategy at a policy level we stabilize the sectors we stabilize the sectors it's not just for example one of the things i think if i have to go back 15 20 years and look at the policy is there was a lot of emphasis on computer sciences and engineering and maybe the uh, the the system was not ready to you know overshoot those numbers to that level in terms of faculty in the adaptation of uh, curriculum content bringing in those engines together and providing the right quality so a lot of people jumped into this engineering and management streams uh, everybody wants to be an engineer and, and everybody wants to be an engineer. 
you know so you know i think we need to also understand uh, uh, how the ecosystem and sectors are moving which sectors are going to do good there are other areas to look at even from a skilling perspective you know on a contrary i would say you know there are electricians uh, who get paid more than electrical qualified engineers look at the data point you know that means electricians in an, in a in a in a city like a delhi bombay bangalore chennai uh, who are residing and working uh, uh, you know within societies or large infrastructures so, so they make Venkatesh, more money than qualified engineers venkatesh i want to stop you here because uh, uh, i have a question for you and 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 dr raman later on which gets into the realm of uh, policy as well as knowledge versus skilling <clears throat> so i'm going to stop you there but it's interesting that you spoke about uh, you know demographic dividend is what i'm guessing that you're really referring to out there uh, and while the demographic dividend is indeed a great opportunity for india uh, uh, having said that it could also be a huge uh, huge potential threat because on the one hand you have so many um, uh, people out there in the working age population uh, and at the same time if we are unable to skill those uh, people uh the employability gap uh is really going to be uh devastating uh, for the entire country right um uh, chetali i i uh, uh, do you have any any take on this uh, question or should i uh, pose another one to you so i was going to actually respond to your previous question which was the whole aspect around upskilling right uh, is it all technology and i very strongly believe that uh, when we are talking about getting ready for the future of work or the world of work of the future technology is going to be a very important component but it's not the only component i think uh, the way at least i look at uh, upskilling for the future we call it five in a box and that five in a box is uh, basically uh, skills mindsets and relationships so my skills will actually have a combination of uh, technology or digital whatever you would want to call it as one component but the other two components are uh, your uh, management leadership uh, or behavioral skills very very important and the third one uh, being uh, technical uh, or functional or domain skills and a lot of examples that uh, you know when was right now giving are actually in that space you know that uh, people are over emphasizing over excelling on one and hence the remaining two are actually taking a back seat so if these are the three skills that somebody would need to think of i think even with all these skills uh, developed at the end of the day if uh, mindset of the people is not worked upon and i have enough examples when we are working with the unicefs of the world where we are realizing the challenges of dealing with the mindset of uh, privilege of getting everything because I, i belong to a certain strata or i believe it it should come to me right so the whole mindset is again a very important piece and finally if the future of uh, the way world is going to operate is actually going to be of solving disjointed problems uh, it is going to be imperative that uh, we think of relationships and networks as a very current skill so upskilling around these five will be super critical according to me the challenges people believe when they start making investments thinking technology will be all and end all clearly it will be super critical but it will not make me ready for the future so that's my view that no one and happy to share more uh, details on it later i am i'm so glad you brought that up because it i mean it totally totally resonates with me at least uh, you know i'm guessing it's probably because of the kind of work that we do but uh, uh it, I thought this question uh, and your responses would be very interesting for our audience because I see the audience being a very diverse mix. We have we have a lot of educationists there. We have a lot of uh, uh, entrepreneurs. We have senior industry leaders as well, and uh, we have a younger audience as, uh, as well. Uh, and I'm guessing that everybody would like to know what the panel thinks about you know the skills of the future. Uh, so I'm, I'm very happy that you brought that up, Dr. Raman. Uh, you are somebody who has been nurturing uh, the future leaders for so many years. uh if i were to ask you what do you think are the three or four really critical skills for the future what would those be according to you yeah connecting with the previous question that you asked about tech centricity and the current one about the future skills see according to me tech centric is something which is given there is no um, no question to debate that's my view uh, tech is going ahead with whichever sector that you are talking about we are talking about technology that is enabling and empowering to become better 
So for sure, tech centricity is going to be there. It's not going to be short lived. It's going to be there. But how am I going to ensure that that technology is making my business process better from a business point of view? And how am I going to have my employees work with that technology? It's not about working with people alone today. It's about working with people and tech together. Where you're going to have intelligence robots there. You're going to have uh, the AI bots, which is going to work along with you. So it's more about that aspect as well. Now, today, if you take, let me take example of uh, Amul. They say it's a digital company which works in the area of milk. Fine. So someone doesn't know milk, milk processing will not be able to do anything with the tech that's going to help them. So uh, tech is definitely important. It's needed. It's not short lived. It's going to be there for forever. How am I going to use it, understand it, get skilled for using it is definitely needed. Having said that, now let me take up from the education point of view. From an education point of view, there were universities which were using the classic PowerPoint presentations and going on. But at the, at the other end of the spectrum, you had people who are still using the chalk and the board to teach. I mean, we are talking about those kind of institutions as well. Now, when we are talking about tech enabling education, uh, the, the, the fundamental is education and not technology. Right. You can you can understand how to go and learn a tool or how can you go and have a, a tech helping you to go and impart education in a better fashion. Right. So the, the skilling is needed of using that tech in the education space. But tech is not everything. Tech is an enabler for sure. And can it can ensure either it can bring in only automation or it can bring in rationalization into the process or possibly a paradigm shift also. But then the fundamental remains of, uh, you know, uh, being tech savvy is a need. But what are the other skills that will be needed of the future is about being mindful. So mindfulness is something which is very important today with the amount of distraction that's happening from one to the other. Today, you're going to have, for example, from the education perspective, I'm going to have participants sitting at different places and I'm going to take a session. How mindful they are, I do not know. So how, how should I ensure that I impart that they, sh they should, you know, have good mindfulness in place to focus on something consistently for about an hour or so? is a skill that has to be imparted, made, make them understand about it. And then apart from that are other aspects like emotional intelligence, empathy, which also are definitely needed, not only the tech skills part of it, right? The problem solving ability. Today, people are looking at problem solvers. Who, which engineer or the management graduate was trained for a COVID situation today? No one thought about it about five years back or even two years back. But today, they're all solving problems. They're all problem solvers telling how will I go and solve this problem on hand? How will I have work from home happening at the same pace? I mean, for an IT, it was a given. People were working from home in the IT sector. Possibly the percentage was different. Today, if you talk about education, again, it's work from home. How will I enable those teachers who are just using PowerPoint presentation and a projector in the classroom to work from home, to get into some kind of platforms, impart, ensure that they go ahead and share the content, evaluate online, it's about technology coming in, but it's about one acceptance. Culturally, there should be a change. Second, they should also be problem solvers because they can't have a tech always helping them do it. So these are some skills which have to be imparted for people to become uh, employable. And uh, also the most important aspect is ability to learn, unlearn, relearn. That's a consistent thing where people should be taught, telling that, hey, look, what you learn is not forever. You should be able to learn unlearn, relearn again and again. It's a question of my mindset, which has to change to consistently be there. So these are some views about technology and other skills, which is needed uh, when you talk about what's needed for future as a skill set and also the tech center to be part of. Thank you. So what I hear you saying, Dr. Raman, is not just high tech, but high touch as well. And uh, uh, all the technology in the world can solve the problem if you miss out, you know, some of the software areas out there. And, and that's so true. We see that happening uh, across uh, so many different playgrounds today, uh, you know, uh, irrespective of sector or industry. Uh, unless you are able to demonstrate, like Chetali said, relationships, networking ability, right? Um, uh, um, you said emotional intelligence, empathy, mindfulness. Um, uh, uh, so what I'm taking out of this, and I'm guessing that's what the participants will take out as well, is it, it's not just tech. It's not just technical skills. Uh, there have to be a marriage between that and, and a lot of soft skills and behavioral aspects as well. Um, fair. Um, uh, Venkatesh, are you there? Yes, I'm pretty much there. Okay. Um, so, quick question for you. Um, uh, what role do you see the public and private sector partnerships playing in enhancing uh, the skilling ecosystem uh, for the country? 
you know, I think, uh, you know, the, the question itself uh, emphasizes the need uh, uh, for sim similar partnerships. You know, the role of public and private sector uh, coming together to address uh, the skill ecosystem is extremely important because uh, one side you have the demand and other side you have the supply and you know both have to marry together in terms of uh, filling the gaps which are there in the ecosystem. Uh, for example, uh, at NSDC, uh, the way we established even if you look into it, it's a PPP model, public-private partnership. The entity the uh, itself is established in the PPP model uh, to bring in the richness of the uh, you know industry in terms of understanding the current workloads, uh, the changes which are happening. Uh, so that we adapt very fast and uh, align with the uh, requirements in terms of either there are jobs which are getting created and sometimes you are losing some jobs and those job roles are changing. The evolution of the jobs are happening, whether let's say an automation, you know, suddenly things are changing and there's a new technology coming into play. So we have to skill people. For example, an RPA comes into play in an automation. Suddenly we realize that RPA is not our, uh, in our list of qualified packs or NOSIS, uh, which are the standards for building curriculum. And then we immediately look into building those RPA. So as to we we reskill people and we skill people around that particular segment or sector. I think uh, for any country to progress, if you look into Germany, Australia, some of the advanced countries in terms of the skilling ecosystem, always it's been an, a very tight partnership between the public and the private entities coming together. You know, either in terms of discussion of the way forward, filling the gaps exchange of knowledge, ex exchange of transfer of knowledge at a rapid pace, and even within investments also, you know, uh, because until unless the private sector invests into the public partnerships, you know, and understands the nitty gritties and challenges, execution can't happen at the free flow, what it have it generally happens in a de very developed countries and nations. So I think in all aspects, right from uh, skill gaps uh, to, you know, understanding workloads and to train the capacities, and also to align with the uh, fast moving rapid changes which are happen happening in those sectors, not just technology centric, but even sectorial centric, uh, a, a public private partnership has a lot of significance. Thanks, thanks, Mekadesh. Let's take this question to Anil. Anil, uh, uh, as an investor, uh, what trends have you seen towards funding startups engaged in promoting upskilling and reskilling? Of course, uh, I think edtech is, is 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 you know new buzzword in investment community. I think uh, most of the investments are happening because these are now enablers, uh, not only in in helping doing business but also in helping financing business. So certainly, you know, for short term, uh, you know, uh, all this uh, ventures or, or startups which are which are focusing on this are, are, are you know, getting a lot of prominence. But as things will settle, I think uh, people will start looking at you know, other uh, domain areas. Uh, so, but uh, currently, uh, I think that is the failure. So I'm guessing what you're also referring to is, you know, this huge spurt towards uh, virtual learning that's happened in the last three to four months. Of course, it was there earlier as well. People were doing it. They were the Baidus of the world, the toppers. So, you know, depending on whether you were in primary and secondary supplemental education, language learning, um, uh, test prep, so, uh, you know, uh, so many segments out there, or uh, online skilling and certifications, for instance. Um, it was happening, but what I hear you saying is it's, it's, it's uh, taken a spurt in the last three or four months uh, owing to COVID. Dr. Raman, a question for you. Uh, uh, do you see this uh, changing uh, dramatically uh, once, uh, you know, the, the COVID situation gets a little better? Uh, do you see uh, it coming back to its old levels, or do you think it will always remain above the, uh, you know, the previous level? See, post-COVID is something people are guessing. What things are going to happen? How things are going to change? Will it be drastically changing? Will it uh, go back to the original one? You know, these are questions that are coming up. And in fact, I wanted to ask the same questions to the HRs of uh, different uh, organizations telling, how would you look at if uh, a, a brand like SABM, which has got, say, 180 students who joined me for an MBA program about, or about 80 students who joined me for an innovation entrepreneurship program. Uh, if I'm going to go online and say I'm going to offer an MBA program, 
and I uh, shoot up because then the infrastructure is only about the server that is needed and uh, about uh, how do I handle them on an online mode. From 180, I'm going to go zoom up to about 18,000. What happens? You know, so because I get about, say, 100,000 applications, uh, why should I scan and say no and take only 180? I'll take about 18,000 of them and start, uh, you know, delivering sessions online. The corporate will definitely not look at those 18,000 the same way they are looking at 180 of my students today. Unfortunately, in India, if you take up education, they are looking at how I get a job posted. That's one of the fundamental questions, at least at an MBA level that people are asking. Even today, if you look at the big B schools, the number of students who take up entrepreneurship is very, very low. Okay, the percentage is very less. They still are looking out for good jobs, good brands, good profiles. I mean, it is about package, profile, prospects and placements is what MBA is all about today. Unfortunately, that is the case with majority of students. So that being the case, if there are people who are telling that, hey, look, education will change and you'll have a lot of them who are going and, you know, taking education online, it will be going and hitting the masses. So, I, I I tend to agree, but I also tend not to agree on two aspects. One, the brand value might not be perceived the same by the corporate who is going to look at students to hire. You know, that will not be the same from a 180 to 18,000. But at the same time, this gives an opportunity for uh, big brands to go and give education of specific skill sets possibly uh, to masses. That That's possible and uh, that possibly can happen. So according to me, it will be a blended mode that will work. Everything going online possibly might not happen so soon. But for sure, there's going to be a change. People will look at blended mode of, uh, you know, imparting education. And there, there will be a dire need for skilling, upskilling, reskilling, all that happening for it to become a new normal. So these are some thoughts from my end. So I have two perspectives on that. And I'll request Chaitali to then comment on my perspective. Uh, one, I think it's, it's uh, 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 well, I tend to agree with you, Dr. Raman. Uh, let's take an example. When the IIM decided to proliferate beyond your A, B, C, and L. One of the first things that came up, and not just from uh, uh, you know the IIMs themselves or, or other educational institutes, even from the corporate sector, was that is the IIM going to be diluting their brand value? Because if instead of four you have you know sixteen out there, uh, then uh, there's a certain brand dilution. Now I'm not saying I agree with it, but that was a huge uh, challenge which was thrown up. Uh, but let's look at it the other way. Let's say if all the new IIMs were able to provide the same quality and rigor that the original IIMs were providing, would that question still have been raised? I don't know. I mean, that's, uh, that's something that, you know, uh, needs to be thought about. Um, the other point that you brought up, and I love that point, which is uh, focus not as much on the knowledge uh, dissemination, but on the kind of skills that you can, you know, offer through the program. So, for instance, if instead of 180, we have 18,000 students out there and each of them is not coming out with an MBA degree or a postgrad diploma in management, but they're coming out of the institute with skills which are easily and quickly deployable in the corporate sector or outside the corporate sector, then it may not really be an issue about 180 versus an 18,000 because then it's about, okay, are the skills there and if the skills are there, how do we use them? Uh, that's my two penny on that, but Chaitali, uh, hoping that uh, you would have some thoughts on that as well. I think the moment we start talking about, uh, you know, technology, uh, literally democratizing learning, we'll have to keep two things in mind. Uh, what's the rationale behind uh, my learning? And I think uh, what uh, I just heard was absolutely true. A lot of people are going uh, and picking up that MBA not to learn, not to upskill themselves, but because they believe that's their uh, passport to a job, right? I think uh, what's happening is at the end of the day, uh, we uh, I, I like to call it learning intelligence, which is about why to learn, what to learn, how to learn. People can take away everything from you, but they cannot take away your ability to learn and keeping yourself advanced in the game. And if that is what you have, regardless of which degree you pick up, from where you pick up or you don't pick up, if it is not just about making myself uh, uh, land at a place where I can get a job, it will have to be. And, and that's where the whole mindset conversation becomes supremely important. If I think that I have just landed in the best uh, university or the best school, and as a result of which I, all that I needed to do was to get a job, 
the only difference between uh, the past and the few, uh, current or future is going to be that chances are you may yet not land a job because the biggest challenge uh, you know corporations are actually giving to educational institutes is how are you rethinking uh, employability of people which basically means even if i have that 180 or 200 batch of them even they cannot absolutely be guaranteed job because the world is changing so dramatically so my purpose of learning has to be very clear in my mind am i actually expecting that i will pick up a degree and then i'll be taken care of to some extent we will get taken care of beyond a certain point it won't happen i think the big opportunity and the need is to get people more self aware about how do they make themselves future ready and in that context democratized learning will be the biggest asset we can give to people and people can uh, pick up otherwise it's, if it's just about making myself more employable i think uh, it will uh, corporations will continue to want to have a smaller pool of course why don't want to look at 18000 but 180 because i'm expecting that a certain uh, uh, you know uh, selection process has allowed me to now look at a smaller mass so i think that's the way i look at it but very very interesting perspective uh, in terms of uh, while education can be democratized how do you make it more purposeful thanks thanks jethali thanks dr raman uh, my next question is for venkatesh and dr raman uh but the others can feel free to 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 respond as well uh venkatesh uh since we were talking about democratizing learning uh and you know upskilling at scale online learning is going to play a vital role there it already is uh, now i'm not just talking about the moocs at this stage i'm getting into the kooks and you know all those those other platforms uh <laughs> out there because one of the issue with moocs was that uh um uh, i think as one of the panelists earlier mentioned the low completion rates also that's more around knowledge focus than than you know really getting people to pick up uh, applicable skills and and getting them to apply stuff that immersive learning uh to a large extent has been lacking in books uh from your perspective venkatesh how do you see online learning addressing the challenge of upskilling at scale uh and not just in india but let's say across other markets as well Mm-hmm. so i think you know uh, from an uh, covid perspective i look into the current situation everything is online there's no even a blended format and an opportunity for a blended format of learning uh, but eventually if you see uh, you know the next few years and the time to go uh, one thing which i think if i pick up an insight uh, why online is becoming so active and people are uh, shifting towards online or the role of online skilling whether not only within the mooc ecosystem but even in the corporates and even the uh, talent as we go in schools and colleges is that you know the you know at a, at an worldwide level if you look by look into an 7 billion plus population you know as per gartner we have roughly 24 to 25 billion devices that doesn't mean everybody has one connected device but people have multiple connected devices so there is kind of an uh, you know expectation they have by 2030 is that from this 24 25 billion uh, devices connected devices across the world which we have it is expected that these connected devices will touch close to 50 billion you know look at the kind of a number in terms the uh, of growth rate of these devices whether it's an smartphone or your desktop or your laptops or your connected uh, watches now you know uh, smart watches you know there's a lot of emphasis in which uh, the connected devices uh, if you pick up any report either a gartner or a forester or an idc uh, all the projections are moving towards you know increased amount of uh, spending is happening in connected devices and people are using multiple connected devices so the opportunity for individuals to use these devices uh, for learning will also increase potentially you know so the content and unfortunately in some countries still the traditional formats of teaching is happening uh, i think if, if you are looking at a scaling at a larger ecosystem uh, you know any way online is the certainly the game ga- game changer in a country like india for example uh, there would be a certain class of people who don't have infrastructure laptops and connectivity and the bandwidth those issues will exist and those will really issues will not be wiped out in a span of 2 to 3 years or 3 to 5 years Uh, so there's a lot of distinction between india and bharat you know so that difference will certainly exist but in those cases also there are blended formats which are taking in uh, a new shape and a new avatar how can some of your course workloads can be converted into online and how can some of them can be on a blended format 
or complete online is not possible in you know leaving few sectors because uh, there are sectors you know we when we talk about online the only thing if you look into the worldwide MOOCs and edX or the courseras and uh, you know Khan Khan academies of the world mostly they touch upon these stem stem centric courses and technology centric courses and even if you talk to their uh, you know heads of these organizations and the founders you will see that the consumption on courses on ai data uh, devops these are the courses which are highly consumed but if you look into the uh, sectorial uh, areas of course, you know, as some sectors, you know, around services, you can go completely online. But in other sectors, you certainly need a blended format. Uh, it is not about the opportunity of having a device, but it's also the opportunity of getting that skill uh, and testing that skill. And of course, those test uh, test patterns or workload patterns can't be completely online. They have to be blended format. But online certainly gives a massive scale in terms of uh, reach. Uh, see, in a, a, an experience, what you can create, create across these uh, 20 billion plus devices, what people are using today, and that gives an opportunity to learn anytime, anywhere, any device. You know, in, these are all interoperable devices. So that's an opportunity you certainly have. But having said it, a blended format will also coexist uh, with sectors and with infrastructure difficulties people would have in developing countries, for example, like India and all. Uh, you know, there's a certain section of population and that's a major section of population which may not have the right bandwidth, the right infrastructure, right uh, laptops. And, uh, you know, the cost of devices is also high. So these con these challenges will continue. So some of the some of the uh, challenges of online are beginning to get resolved, uh, but again, uh, at a very very small scale right now, Venkatesh, uh, I, I agree. Uh, like for instance, now you have cloud labs which help facilitate a way more immersive experience for learners, uh, which otherwise you know would have been uh, relegated to pure theoretical understanding of of, of various concepts. Uh, but again, how many? Uh, 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 how many platforms are offering or are able to offer cloud labs, how effectively are they being able to offer and the kind of programs that they're offering it for. For instance, one of the, the participants uh, asked a question, uh, you know, how do you practice science and chemistry uh, uh, online, right? Uh, that's a valid question. Um, uh, uh, and it's not just limited to that. I mean, there are so many other areas where uh, online does prevent a constraint. But I, I guess hearing, hearing all of you, what I'm guessing is, we're saying it's, it's a gradual process. Uh, and B, maybe we don't even want to replicate everything online because there's a place uh, for, for both the worlds to coexist. Uh, so online helps you scale up, right? Take learning, uh, take scaling to a much wider audience. Whereas, uh, you know, uh, the traditional method uh, is able to take care of the other stuff. So blended learning is your right least step into this. Uh, uh, you know, is probably what we would see more of. Dr. Raman, from an education perspective, let's yeah. say a uh, hypothetical question. If you had to uh, make a difference uh, within your realm, within your domain, uh, uh, one thought from you, and it could be a wild thought right now, uh, if you had to completely transform the learning experience, not just for people within your campus, but for so many people who are unable to come to your campus, for whatever reason, how would you do that? See, uh, before I answer the question, Ned, I'd love to link it to the previous question about challenges of online learning, you know, uh, for sure online learning is going to give a lot of advantage of reaching the masses, no doubt about it, because inherently you can ensure that you can hit so many, all they need is a device and a connectivity to the internet and possibly a good, good, a good uh, bandwidth to go and get the lessons is either in a synchronous mode, if it's going to be a live session or an asynchronous mode if it's recorded and kept there. But let us go and look at the practical situation of India. We, I mean, we are sitting in in cities like Mumbai, Pune, Delhi, all that is great. I'll give an example. Today, it's not about roti, kapada, makan. It's about bijali and bandwidth as well. So you'll have to add those two. Uh, along with roti, kapada, makan, you'll have to have bijali and bandwidth for all this to happen. Now, I'll give a classic example from Mumbai to Pune. If you're going to travel, there is a small town called Onavla. Even today, there is seven hours power cut there. Every day, seven hours of power cut in a place called Onavla, which is just a hill station. People go there for rains, hanging out there. Not possible during COVID scenarios now. But this is one which is exactly between two big cities. You know, you've got Mumbai, uh, you know, the com commercial capital of India, as well as Pune, which is kind of the IT hub of India. 45 minutes drive from here, you don't have, and it's a town, which not a town which nobody knows about it, but People know about it, know for Chiki and also for rains and the falls there. But it has got a seven hour power cut. Now, this is an example like this. There are possibly thousands of towns and tire three uh, towns and villages and rural areas 
where we talk about India and population, we say we go and hit the masses. Where do they have the bijli? If there is no bijli, then comes bandwidth. Post that. Okay, a phone functions because it needs only a battery, right? Again, if it's going to be working on a bandwidth hungry mode, the battery also drives down fast. A lot of innovation has to happen in this area. Where can I get devices which can work with one charge for about 25 hours? Yeah, then digital becomes really powerful. But we don't have such devices that you power that device and works for 25, 24 hours without a recharge. If that happens, then there will be a lot of disruption that can happen when it comes to education reaching masses or to people who are there because all they need to is at least only charge once for a day or two and yeah. they can keep going. Yeah. But that is not the case today. So this is one of the biggest challenge. Apart from this challenge of infrastructure and as I told you, the electricity and other aspects, the whole concept of digital learning itself is different. People think I'll put the entire lecture of two and a half hours into and say that is digital learning. Will not work. I can quote NPTEL, go and look at NPTEL's videos. There are three hours lectures, four hours lecture, continuously yes. some fellow sitting and talking on and on and on with the board. Will not work. So the digital learning requires a different approach, a different mindset and a different strategy altogether. If you want to go and create courses online or deliver courses online. Right. And it's not about content alone. See, there is a book I would go and say Content Trap by Bharat Anand of uh, Harvard, who has written this book called The Content Trap. People th keep thinking of content, content, content. It's much more than content when it comes to digital learning. It's not content alone. Content is only one small part of the entire digital learning part of uh, education. So there are so many issues when it comes to practical implementation of uh, you know, this online learning from an India perspective. If you want to bring in inclusion into it. Else, you'll be only talking about those elite who have a MacBook who can go and have a 24 by 7 a gen set supply with them and possibly, a, a, you know, a triple redundant system to connect to internet where they have a, a fiber as well as a 4G connectivity which switches over. For them, digital learning is fabulous because you are, you are there always live. But in, in India, the scenario is not so. So it is not as we, that everything we know digital. It is a difficult game. Innovation has to play a great role in ensuring that we make this happen. That That's my view. So you've actually answered my last question. I mean, my, my next question also to a large extent, which is, uh, uh, you know, taking this to the masses uh, and what are the potential challenges that we might face there? Um, uh, uh, and you brought up another concept, which is uh, that uh, for this to be really successful uh, for learners, uh, uh, it's not just the content. Uh, the facilitators, instructors themselves need to have a massive mind shift change. Uh, and that's so right. I mean, I know when we do leadership interventions for our corporate clients, uh, in the last three, four months, the big challenge that we've seen is uh, guys who were amazing facilitators on ground, uh, are now suddenly coming down from a rating of a four and a half, five on five to about one and a half, two on five. Uh, and uh, uh, the feedback that's coming in is that these sessions are completely uh, uh, non-engaging uh, because all they've done is they have changed the medium. Instead of standing out there, they're you know doing it virtually. But you rightly said the entire design needs to change. And I think that's, that's uh, the kind of mind shift change that will need to come in to really make this workable. Okay. Um, uh, oh, one, uh, sorry to interject, but I have yes, views here, right? So there are yeah. two things, you know, I, I, I agree to Dr. Uh, you know, Raman on, on some of the aspects. There are two things, you know, one, the current situation where, you know, I have no option but to get locked in, right? I can't move out of house. And then second thing, you know, when things, you know, uh, could be in between and then, you know, we are in normal situation, right? So infrastructure issues, I think as an investor, I see there is an opportunity because if it is going to prolong, it makes sense, you know, uh, exploring solutions which helps you know, delivering to people who are not able to consume who want to consume, right? That's one aspect. So I think uh, uh, these problems can be addressed, not not bigger. I think there are devices, you know, uh, you know I don't know how to put on that, but I think that's addressable. I think the challenge is, you know, we are not, you know, uh, adoptive to current situation. I can't, you know, keep sitting you know, on one place and keep doing it and then I'm only in four walls. I think we are all trying to learn, you know, to adopt to a current situation. I think it's more a question of survival, right? Uh, however, I think current situation is actually offering opportunity for us to, you know, you know learn something new. 
and and also to explore something which was not you know otherwise explored right for example we speak about online education i myself have made couple of investments in education but those investments were ahead of time i had my share of experience on that right but see today in last two months things have changed drastically right people are only talking about investments in education space so at tech space because that's a way you know uh, way to go forward for example i have a school infrastructure which can accommodate thousand students uh, but but i can't have them in my campus because you know law doesn't allow me so how do i do right how do i survive right i have to pay salaries i have to keep infrastructure intact and then i adopt to a solution which helps me connect to my audience right my consumer my customer or or students right and this is actually offering you know opportunity to think beyond you know uh, what we had been doing so i just go you know uh, uh, to a discussion uh, you know, a few minutes back about you know 182 to 18000 students right uh, why don't you look at a different perspective right i am only able to take 180 students but this solution is allowing me to address to you know another you know uh, 17000 plus students who are potentially good probably would have lost because of one mark two mark three mark whereas the 180 blend is you know you know how it is right i still have quota system so i am just talking about some percentage of 180 which is excellent and then i still have to deal with the balance right uh, but whereas this you know 18000 i have a different perspective i am able to you know train more you know good brains right so you have to think in different perspective i can keep finding problems but uh, uh, you know as a investor you know we try to keep look at opportunities right if there is no power let's bring power and help people consume it right now oh, let's create an alternate source of power <laughs> sure no, I, i respect that view i respect that view and uh, I, i i see where you're coming from uh, anil um uh, oh, venkatesh the next question is for uh, you and chetali actually um chetali uh, how different are people's attitudes towards upskilling and reskilling uh, in different markets you you've been exposed to different markets uh, at pwc and even in your prior organization do you see a difference in proclivities or 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 attitudes of people towards learning the way they learn the way they want to learn or you know in general what is their attitude towards uh, uh, upskilling themselves i think uh, i would not take the lens of uh, a country uh, on this one because eventually we are all human beings and and we are an outcome of what exposures we have right uh, so regardless of where i am uh, i have always seen that uh, learning intelligence like i mentioned earlier this is uh, it's a very inherent uh, piece that people have that are individuals regardless of backgrounds who are more motivated who understand the need uh and and uh, you know they look at their need to actually be i had there's a lot of self motivation that is required for people to continuously push themselves there's a lot of drive that is required for people to a accept that there is a need for me to continuously push myself and keep learning so i wouldn't take a regional or a ethnic cut yeah. i would actually yeah. say it's basically uh, inherent uh, uh, amongst people there are some who believe they know it all and there are some who just believe they need to keep knowing all the time more and more the learning orientation of the individual uh, would play a definite role there um, yeah venkatesh uh, 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 what's what's your perspective on this uh, uh, any 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 uh, difference uh, that you would want to kind of bring up so i think uh, you know uh, your question on in terms of um, how do people uh, look at different countries uh, would depend on the stage at which the country is and also the kind of developments that are happening uh, because uh, uh, traditionally in a, in a in a country like india if i look into uh, reskilling there would be some you know mind shift uh, challenges and the thinking process uh, in terms of reshifting at different age groups uh, those would be very different from uh, one country to the other it all depends on a uh, lot of social their upbringings their thinking patterns and all of that so uh, eventually what we will see is with the uh, technology enabling this uh, you know the new new technologies enabling this change uh, and also taking filling the gap you will see slowly that uh, organizations will uh, share for example the need for reskilling uh, is primarily to uh, help them 
they help the employees if i'm looking into an organization to better perform to improve their productivity and also uh, contribute a lot to the ecosystem at the same time be relevant in an in an ecosystem for example if i look into the uh, is in uh, the attitudes of individuals those are you know not can't be dealt only with technology those are psychological in nature their thinking their patterns and lot of things define for example if you have two kids and one one is in class 5th and other is in class 2nd uh, while i was growing up there was an age difference of 5 years between me and my sister but the choices were almost the same the choice of music the choice of learning the choice of uh, you know devices but if you look into the current generation 5 years means there are five generation gaps you know uh, even if you have two kids and those two kids would be listening to different musics playing different games looking at different avenues to learn uh, would be on different social medias you know for one could be on instagram the one could be on facebook so you know the 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 shift is happening so rapidly that these uh, changes the generation gaps which are like 10 years now coming close to 2 years 1 year and uh, this will uh, actually uh, be also one of the factors individuals will think whether i need reskilling uh, you know if that is the question i think most of them now feel that they need reskilling it's not the question of they they don't feel the need i think uh, how you enable that change within an organization so that the kind of hindrance they have or uh, problems they have in terms of the change uh, can be dealt with uh, a very nice manner that's where your behavioral training as well as corporate trainings are required uh, wherein we update them that this change is for you for your betterment and for your own existence and uh, relevance so that's that's how organizations should look at uh, maybe from country to country we can't compare because there are more than 200 plus countries and uh, each country will have its own uh, dynamics okay thanks thanks venkatesh uh i am opening up the conversation to questions because i noticed that there were a whole lot of questions which had come in earlier uh so uh, uh participants uh, uh i am going to go back to some of the questions but in the interim if there are any new questions you can keep typing those in and we'll try and address all of those so i'm just going to throw it to the panel and i leave it to the panel uh, to respond to those uh so one of the questions that's come up is uh, <clears throat> there are so many online learning platforms um and and they're offering the same course um i guess uh, what the the um, person is really asking is so let's take an example uh platform 1 offering a course in data science platform 2 offering a course in data science platform 3 4 5 offering a course in data science data science data science uh, uh when you look at it how do you uh, how do you make out which which platform to go to uh how do you define uh, how do you gauge credibility so jap mohan i i have a view to that sorry um and and my view is uh, you know when you are into a new city or a new town and you need to see a specialist which is a doctor um and there is a doctor one there is a doctor two and there is a doctor three right uh what do you do you actually look uh, for word of mouth you look for feedback and you try and understand uh you know what's uh, each doctor good about uh, what does the doctor offer and you try and understand what is it that you need my child is crying key so i want a pediatrician who's a little more understanding so i'll try and understand what suits my needs and in accordance i'll make a choice yeah, i think it's exactly yeah okay uh so one of the things that's happening is so for doctors there are a huge amount of rating mechanisms right and i can go online check within the city how they now, are. now now there is yeah uh online platforms uh, still uh, uh while there are some platforms who who have a very transparent rating mechanism right so previous students previous cohorts or what have they uh, uh, rated programs on but uh, a lot of them today even even now I uh, still don't have a system whereby you could go and say, okay, let me look at uh, you know what the previous batches uh, thought about this program or the faculty, uh, and uh, even with a platform saying that we've had eight batches or seven batches or twenty batches of this going on, uh, if you can't see a review, how do you gauge that? So, what do you think uh, about that, which has no review? It's a tech platform, and it's not feeding you revenue, and it's talking about learning and making you future ready. That's going to be my answer. Mm. So you're saying the absence of that feedback itself is a huge feedback. 
Uh, of course, I would much rather say that if I like something, I will give feedback. And if you're seeing there are seven, eight batches that have passed out, I think uh, in today's world, when everything is so disconnected and everybody's actually point of view is going to be a very important one. And and our contribution also to that point of view. For instance, I went through that coursework and I liked it or I didn't like it. Being able to provide that is is not just uh, a good to do; it's a need to do because that's the only way I will actually make the entire system richer. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. I think you've answered the question on the dot. Now, uh, there's another one. Uh, what are ways that organizations can get involved in the education process so that they are able to create employable candidates or more effective candidates? Uh, uh, so I guess the person is talking about co-creating programs uh, between organizations and 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 the uh, academia. Uh, anybody uh, who wants to pick it up. Uh, you know, I think I can answer this. You know, if you look into large organizations, Jack Mohan, you know, the organizations have really, like I'm talking about the Microsoft, Amazon, uh, Google, Facebook, uh, and even in yeah, Infosys with TCS. I'm talking even from an Indian context uh, perspective. You know, these organizations, each one of them have uh, evolved over a time and they employ a lot of talent coming from colleges and they somehow see the gaps within the industry academia and uh, they have to hire from these campuses regularly. Keeping that in mind, each one of them have very strong campus engagement model. Uh, for example, a TCS uh, or an Infosys in the Indian IT services companies or a HCL or TechM uh, to a uh, Microsoft uh, or an Amazon. They have... Uh, Venkatesh, I think we lost you there. Educate. And I know you talk about a VM where they have their own academy. So all these academies actually... We were talking about networking challenges across the uh, nation a while ago. Uh, this is... Uh, this is testament to that. Is coming back while he rejoins. Uh, let me let me throw another question out there for the panel. Uh, uh, one of the uh, participants has asked, you know, are we expecting business analytics and data science programs to be exhausted, just like MBA and engineering programs have been uh, in the past? Uh, uh, Dr. Raman, I, I I want you to answer that question. See. Uh Always there is a wave, you know, uh, this always happens. This is not something new, right? Take from 90s till date. Okay. There is always a trend that comes up and says, hey, look, this this particular uh, skill set is what is uh, needed in the future. And there is a rush towards computer science. And sometimes it is electronics and communications. Then, you know, this trend keeps changing. So uh, over the past possibly four or five years, it's about data science, blockchain, big data analytics. That's going to be there. And if you actually get into, for example, uh, you know, it will be many times old wine in a new bottle. That's how it happens. It is fundamentally statistics when you look at data science. If someone has got a strong hold in statistics, then uh, then mathematics, and then gets into data science. So uh, many a time it is the fundamental thing that has to be, uh, you know, looked at more than the wave that happens. The wave keeps changing. And uh, once upon a time, it was Java. Then people are telling about, you know, that's the next thing to happen because it's going to be working in any platform. And then there was a change. Programming languages came in. So this Python, trend keeps, R, R, Python, you know, you got this. So this keeps changing on and on. And you can't say that what we're telling right now is going to be there for the next 15 years now. No, it might. Yeah. there might be something new that's coming up. So answering the question, this wave keeps changing. My only submission to students many a time is look at your strength and map them and choose the right strengths that you have with possible career options that you have. I, I, again, linking it to the previous question about, you know, the industry and that and the education, you know, which uh, Venkatesh was answering. Unfortunately, today, many, many corporates are looking at uh, uh, the uh, employability. That's important. I don't say it's not important. Let me give a corollary here. When you talk about uh, you have cars and you need drivers. So corporates are looking for drivers. I need a driver. I don't care about anything else. Does he drive the car? Period. That's what I want. Hey, look, this fellow is well-groomed. He knows how also to go ahead and ensure that the next car. No, no, I want a driver. That's what it is. So exactly many a time what I see from the education perspective is people are hungry for those drivers. And if an educational institution is talking about mobility and a solution for mobility, they say, hell with you. I want drivers. And there are corporates who 
pump in their money, get the drivers trained, ensure that they know how to drive the car, they know how to hold the steering and change the gears and get going. That's what is actually happening now. So not many are engaging with educational institutions to bring in solutions for mobility. In fact, that should happen. That's the place where it's not about job ready. It's about future of jobs ready is what the corporate should engage with institutions rather than going and looking at the current one. I feel that there is a lot of gap there because this uh, gap between industry academia has been there for past 20 years. I've been hearing this and that will continue. And if that is the case, they should look at only diploma uh, students. They should not look at engineering graduates and management graduates who are talking about the next thing in the industry or industry leading, I would say, not not only industry ready. So that's the place where I think corporates should invest their time, effort and energy if they want to bring in solutions that could possibly help them for future. Yeah. I think that's a great view. And in fact, I'd like to kind of add there, uh, going back to some of the discussion that we had around, uh, you know, skills for the future. Uh, while data science might be replaced with something entirely different in the future, uh, you know, something else might come up uh, instead of an MBA, a generic MBA. But some of these skills that we spoke about, whether it was empathy, mindfulness, relationship, networking ability, uh, you know, uh, all of that is always going to be relevant because uh, irrespective of uh, what the functional or technical area that you are studying in is, uh, these skills or the, the relevance of these is not going to change anytime soon. So I'm saying that that was very useful because uh, people can actually continue building their capabilities on some of these other skills so that irrespective of what changes on the functional part, they, they still have a greater probability of being relevant. Okay, there is another question uh, uh, which, which, which is there and uh, Anil, this one has come for you. Uh, what factors are investors considering before investing in the education sector or the tech sector, is the appetite to look at ROI in the short term or look at betting on the future? So, see, of course, uh, ROI is important, but uh, we as an investor always take long term view. Right? Uh, we never invest, you know, for short term gain. So, all investments are basically with a perspective of long term. Now, you know, what we look at is whether the given opportunity is scalable or not, right? So, as I have said in the past, uh, is it only a stop gap arrangement? Then it's a different kind of investment. But if it is a long term, uh, for example, you know, we just, you know, spoke about 180 and 18,000. And if I see there is a merit in 18,000, probably you will find an investor there, right? Because it offers the scope for uh, scaling. And it also okay. spoke for people to, you know, benefit from it. So it's a genuine, you know, requirement. So depending upon the size of the opportunity and scale, uh, you know, uh, we, we, you know, look for investment. If it's short term, uh, probably, you know, you'll have different kind of investment. Uh, as far as ROI is concerned, it's important. I hope it helps. So yeah, yeah so, so I guess what you're saying is, look, it, it, it scalability has to be there, of course, and you're looking at scalability. Uh, you're also looking at, uh, 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 but you're not just looking at scalability. Before that, you're looking at fundamentally how strong is the idea, uh, how strong is the team, you know, uh, 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 is there a product market fit, uh, and 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 oh, uh, so, uh, all of that. Uh, other you know, several other factors. Uh, so uh, you know, I can speak at length on that. But considering this specific question, uh, yes, certainly look for future investments are all long term. Uh, two aspects I will try to highlight here. One, how big is the market, and whether uh, the scalability, uh, you know, is there or not. Rest, right? You know, team, uh, you know, quality, IPR, you know, uh, competition, substitute. You know, that all will be there. But considering this specific question, I think this, this. Sure. Uh, Venkatesh, the next question is for you. Um, so, if we have to, uh, are you there, Venkatesh? Yes, sir, I'm there. Um, so, if we have to scale up the entire, you know, skilling ecosystem, and, and uh, there's a lot of work that NSDC, of course, is doing in that. Uh, how do you see uh, this being augmented by involving uh, startups 
uh, in the edtech space. Uh, is that something that you guys are already doing? Is that on the anvil, or, or, or is that something that you know you think uh, may not yield much? No, I, I think uh, startups certainly play a major role in terms of uh, enabling skilling at uh, various levels, at an at an pan India level, even at a grassroots level. So NSDC is uh, the forefront and already in doing this in terms of partnering with various startups, uh, startups which are uh, we have a portal called eSkill India. So, you know, if I would request all the audience also to have a look at it. eSkill India is a one-stop portal to, uh, you know, to connect uh, various people, individuals who are looking at skilling ecosystem. And we have multiple startups, uh, you know, across India, which are linked to eSkill India. And from through eSkill India, we provide even connect of those startups with the larger ecosystem to benefit. Uh, so, you know, as you know, NSDC is not for profit. Uh, we work with different stakeholders at uh, different uh, stages. And with startups, we are actively been involved, not just during the COVID times, even pre-COVID times, uh, we are engaged very actively. Because if you look into Jack Mohan, the way we operate, uh, uh, NSDC is like an Indian Indian postal office. So we have uh, a wide coverage uh, out of 850, close to 850 plus districts. We have coverage in almost uh, 812 of them through uh, Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Kendras. So in, uh, you know, which are the centers of excellence we have set up in these uh, districts. And at every Every uh, level of, uh, you know, at an uh, India level, at an uh, state level, at a district level, there are multiple startups we engage with, uh, you know, either they are education content providers or they are into the aspect of driving online LMS and uh, like the one like yours, uh, or they are into they are into testing uh, or monitoring or some of the startups are also into a new age AI centric uh, applications like Better Place with which we work wherein BetterPiz is helping us making sense of the lot of data and helping uh, the you know individuals and recruiters with access to uh, qualified uh, you know candidates who are available in our ecosystem. Uh, that's an interesting startup uh, which works with us. Then we have Importers, for example, it's an Amazon funded uh, startup and on AWS platform. They provide a very interesting online connecting to enable classes, uh, and we are doing a lot of work with them. Uh, you know, uh, in terms of reaching out to larger ecosystems and providing online, you know classes uh, through the platform. So we work with a bunch of the startups and not just in one direction from content to uh, live uh, platforms to LMSs and, uh, you know, a, a wide area of things. I think that amply, that amply uh, addresses the question. Thank you so much, Mankatesh. That was, that was insightful. Uh, there are a couple of questions for Dr. Raman. Uh, Dr. Raman, uh, uh, we have here Bijli and bandwidth is very costly. Bills are shooting up, jobs are drying up. Uh, we don't know what's next in store. Uh, are we only creating, um, you know, uh, people uh, who are passing out uh, of campuses or are they also going to be able to get a job? Which means, uh, I think the question really is, where is campus hire or campus hiring heading? Uh, wow, that's a tough one. Yeah. So uh, now it is COVID. Okay, and people talk, are talking about placements. How are things going to change or how is the scenario going to happen? According to me, this is not the first time and we have seen uh, the same kind of scenarios where the placements were a problem. Let us take, for example, 99-2000.com bubble burst. There was a problem. So it was short-lived, 99-2000-2001 and then things changed. Again, it was uh, repeated in about 2009-10 uh, when there was a problem. So now again about uh, 2020, there is a problem. So for sure, uh, this will change. It's not going to be there forever. And when I say jobs changing, having seen placement trends, if a corporate is planning to hire about 10 of them, they don't hire 10, they look at three or four hires. So campus hiring does happen. It doesn't stop there, but it is about the best of the ones who get placed. So if you look at the tier one uh, schools and engineering institutions, placement will definitely happen. Corporates need people. It's not that they don't need people and it's all dried up. But yes, it's going to be a problem if someone is going to look at the other track. Unfortunately, there is a caste system in the inst educational institutions in this country. You got a A category, A star category, B category, and that decided by students. I'm not referring to any rankings here. It depends on the number of applications that an institution gets, which shows how good that institution is. 
because the students are applying for it and if you take a JE exam for example there are lakhs who write it because they know what it, uh, what an IIT is similarly there are others which are good by both in the government as well as private sector so those places placement is not going to be an issue but it's going to be a tough fight I agree and I say it's not an issue I don't say it's cakewalk it's going to be a tough fight for sure but for other institutions which have been riding the wave and it's like me too every uh, even cats running the rat race, for them, it's going to be a problem. So answering that question, it depends on which institution you are, whether you're you know, going to face uh, problems or if uh, things are going to be just tough there. That's that's my response to that question. Yeah. So, Jagmoon, uh, I'll just add, I don't know how many of uh, you uh, remember Mandal Commission. Of course. There was a lot of burning happening around that time. So, so, so we are the victim of Mandal Commission, right? Uh, our ex one term, you know, exactly got wiped out. And uh, we passed out. Normally, people, you know, complete their exams in Feb, March, April. Results are out in May, June, July. We gave our exams somewhere in August. We got our results somewhere in October, right? Year was almost gone. Corporates had hired. Jobs were not there. You know, it was frustrating to get home for a month or so. But I think even we didn't have any idea because nobody had faced, you know, uh, those kind of challenges in the past. We learned, you know, hard way that the best way, you know, to uh, be relevant is, you know, uh, the topic today is about upskilling, right? Uh, don't miss out. Uh, you will never get, you know, such kind of opportunity where time is with you. Uh, you know, most of the time today, uh, people like me, Jeff Moon or Italy, if you want to learn something, it's very tough, right? Because you have got into some kind of branding. But as a student, uh, I think uh, if time is available, just see what additional you can do, uh, how you know you can be more relevant. Uh, yes, uh, time is tough. Uh, for example, I was reading, you know, uh, yesterday's or today's newspaper when one of the big corporate was saying that how do we pay if we don't have business? It's true, right? How how are some you know, somebody can keep paying when they don't, you know, have, you know, uh, revenue generating, you know, activities. So, uh, we have to be practical. I think this is the best time to up, up, upskill, uh, learn something new. Uh, if you are thinking of, you know, uh, higher courses, uh, just go for it, right? Because uh, even, you know, uh, your competition level have changed, right? People are finding it tough. Uh, at one side, you are competing with so many people. Infrastructure issues is that they make best use of it. I think uh, this year actually is going to surprise many of us. So be positive. Look for you know something which you can you know add to your PT. Uh, wait for right opportunity. Jobs will follow. Don't worry. I think that's an excellent point there, Anil. Um, excellent point, uh, Sayani. Uh, I am. Uh, uh, I I think your question is answered uh, between you know what venkatesh said uh, and 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 uh, uh, anil and dr raman i'm just going to add to it so uh, your question in terms of you know uh, is a management degree a prereq uh, to get promoted or uh, get ahead in your career uh, apart from what the panelists have said i just want to add two three things one uh, a degree will never uh, be the only decisive factor uh, in how 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 far would you get in your career? Uh, uh, it's usually most impactful only at the entry stage, okay. But once you are there, uh, uh, it ceases to matter. What matters more is uh, the amount of uh, other characteristics that you can demonstrate. So, for instance, your ability to think on the job, your ability to reinvent yourself. So you may have a degree in something else, but your paradigm changes. Uh, what the organization would want to see is, is this person able to kind of adapt, you know, uh, I, I hate to say the new normal, but is the person able to adapt to the change circumstance? Uh, what's your learning orientation? How empathetic are you? And, and by empathetic, I don't mean you have a halo around your head, but uh, for instance, how well are you able to relate to people around you, right? So people skills, your own learning centricity, uh, uh, and the ability and willingness to continuously evolve yourself, I think those more than the degree will decide how, how fast you will move uh, ahead uh, once you've already joined an organization. I hope uh, along with the panelists, you, that a bit addresses your question. Uh, we have time uh, to, we've come to that time where I think uh, we need to wrap up. Uh, so before we wrap up, uh, I just want one, one, 
one word of wisdom, not one word, uh, one pointer from each of the panelists. If you could leave the rest of us uh, with one thing that you you think we should we should think about or, or reflect on, what would that be? Let's start with uh, Chaitali and and move ahead from there. I think Jagmohan, um, in the context of upskilling, I think there are two things I would like to say. Life is a marathon, not a sprint, and so is learning. Uh, I will have to choose my track and I'll have to decide what I want to do. And once I've decided, I'll have to run on it. I think it's it's completely, I, I believe it's, it's completely internal and a person has to make the choice themselves and be on that track. I love that. I think that is that is so, so powerful. That is so powerful. Thank you. Um, Anand? I'll keep it short. Keep learning. Irrespective of what stage you are, keep learning. Whatever age, keep learning. Very powerful again. Venkatesh? Uh, I think tough times will prepare all of us for better tomorrow. And, uh, you know, uh, dealing with uncertainty is one of the aspects one has to learn in personal and professional life. And I think the situation, what is looking right now will evolve into a greater and a better tomorrow. All of us have to deal with this and, uh, you know, ensure that in this process uh, you focus on, prioritize on uh, things which are important, especially from a learning perspective. So it's better that uh, tomorrow the day evolves and there are brighter opportunities. You're already prepared for that. It's like Arnold Schwarzenegger says, right? Uh, uh, I mean, for the fans of those retro movies, no pain, no gain. <laughs> yeah, very so when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Uh, 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 I, I love that. I, I think that is very helpful. Uh, Dr. Raman, uh, we've been so used to our professors, um, uh, you know, leaving us with the final word that I wanted this to be uh, uh, the culmination point. So looking yeah. forward to your. Yeah, uh, I would say. The culture of continuous learning should be something uh, which should be adapted by every organization. That's from an organization point of view. Second, from an individual point of view, uh, the current gen should understand to face failures. The biggest thing that people today refuse is accepting failures. So accepting failure, learning from that failure and get going. If this is uh, clear, then possibly nothing stops the organization. Nothing stops an individual. That's from me. Thank you so much, Dr. Raman. Um, as we come towards closure, uh, I want to thank all the panelists for taking our time. Uh, I know as much as everybody else uh, how many things you have on your schedule, and it was wonderful that you could take our time for this. I also want to thank all the participants for this because uh, we have a diverse group. They're senior leaders from the industry, academia, uh, uh, startup world, and, and all the youngsters as well. Uh, thank you all for making this uh, a, a very uh, uh, enriching discussion. Um, before I leave, I, I want to wish everybody, uh, uh, you know, the best for coming days. Uh, and as, as uh, the panelists said, good times are uh, in the waiting. Um, uh, we started this series of webinars with thought leaders uh, more from the perspective of being able to set up a platform, uh, you know, uh, that enables... Uh, I wouldn't say learnings, uh, uh, that would be, uh, you know, presumptuous on my part, but to enable um, thoughts out there that can, you know, uh, be helpful to us uh, as we progress through our respective lives. Um, uh, and a lot of these sessions, uh, actually all these sessions, links to these are going to be put up on our LinkedIn page. Uh, and uh, uh, we would be very happy for you to follow that. Uh, uh, we are also planning to include ongoing discussions uh, of, uh, and views from these thought leaders. Uh, so it should be an enriching experience for everybody concerned. Uh, do join us on our LinkedIn page. Uh, that's uh, uh, Talgro, uh, T-A-L-G-R-O. Uh, and uh, if you like our videos, uh, uh, do subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. Uh, stay safe, stay good. Thank you so much. <laughs>